purpose of our marriage. Why did Hashem, why did God Almighty want a man to marry a woman? God could have made men like an apple tree. An apple tree doesn't have a wife, but yet bears fruits. Thousands of apples and seeds are created from an apple tree. Why did God need to make it that a man marries a woman? It's a very intriguing question. Many of the holy commentaries discuss this question. The Maharal Miprag says an amazing idea. The Maharal Miprag says that the reason for why Hashem wanted a man to marry a woman is because a man is very, very logical. A man is a different being than a woman. The way he thinks, the way he speaks is totally different than a woman. And a woman is very emotional. For an example, if you ask your wife, how was your day today? She'll talk, she'll talk for 15 minutes with a whole introduction, explaining everything, all the background details, while all you wanted to know is, how was the day at work today? And she told you about the supermarket, and about the shopping, and the ticket, and what's going on? All I ask you is about your day. Women think totally different than men. So we have to get ourselves to understand how do women work and how do men work in order for marriage to work. I wanted to discuss a very, very important mitzvah in the Torah, the mitzvah of marriage. This mitzvah in the Torah was never written as a mitzvah. There's no mitzvah in the Torah, you have to get married. There's no such pasuk that says that you have to get married. But yet we find in the Torah that God tells us to have children and to multiply in the land. And from that pasuk we learn, from that verse we learn, that we have to get married. Interesting. Why did God tell us about the mitzvah of marriage through the commandment of having children? Why didn't God give us the mitzvah of marriage straight up? When you get to the age of maturity, you should search for a wife and find yourself your soulmate and get married and build a home. Why doesn't the Torah tell us? Why doesn't the Torah tell, tell us this mitzvah? So the Chinuch, the Sefer HaChinuch, written approximately about 700 years ago, it's a Sefer that was written, a book that was written to explain all the reasons behind the 613 mitzvot. It says a very interesting answer for that question. He says that God wanted to give us a message. He wanted to hint something to us that we should understand the purpose of our marriage is mainly for our children. The whole purpose, the whole existence of men and women is for our marriage together so we should have children in this world. Why is it so important for us to have children in this world? Why did God make it that we have to get married in order to have children in the world? So the Sefer HaChinuch explains, I'm going to read it to you and explain it. The Sefer HaChinuch explains like this. He says, We have a mitzvah in the Torah to rejoice and be happy with your wife for a whole entire year after marriage. You know, a lot of people get married after, you know, the honeymoon or after a Shevar Brachot. They start going to work and they don't have time for the wife. That's a transgression, a sin. The Torah says a man must spend a year with his wife in the house. A man is not allowed to leave the house for more than one day after the marriage for the first year. He's not allowed to even go to war or for other businesses or matters. He has to live with her for many, many days for about a year. And this is why it says, Clean he has to be for his house, completely for, for his house for one year. And he has to make his wife happy for one year. Why is this, why is this mitzvah so important? Says the Chinuch. Because God, praise be his name, was thinking to create a world. And he desired that the world should be filled with beautiful creations, with beautiful people. But God wanted it specifically to be done through men and women. In order that should be connected to each other purely and holy. They should be together without any sins with marriage and purity. And Hashem made a decree that we should live with our wife for one year to have children in order to accustom 
ourselves to each other. In order that I should be used to the ways that my wife thinks. I should be used to the ways that my wife sees the world and understands the world. So for one year, I have to accustom my nature to her nature and to cling my will to her will, to make her picture be set in my heart, to make her picture be set in my mind, that all I desire is to be with my wife. Now, in order for this to happen, says the Chinuch, we need to spend a lot of time together. You know, they say this thing about quality time. It seems from the Torah, quality time is not enough. We need quantity too. We need to spend a year together to get ourselves used to each other. Says the Chinuch, you know why? Because if you do that, it's going to cause you to stop thinking about other women. It's going to start, you're going to see women in the street and the women in the street are going to look to you just another image, another image of God. And when your wife sees a man in the street, it will look to her, it will appear to her, just another man, another image of God. Nothing to do with me. My man is at home. My wife is at home. That's how Hashem wants us to live life. To the point where I have to be with her to, for, for a year together so our natures will connect. Our thoughts will connect. And all this why, says the Chinuch, Vayuchshiru ha'iladim sheteled lo, your children will end up being kosher. The children that your wife will bring to the world will be kosher. And the world will be beautiful and will find favor in the eyes of its creator. And that's why it says that a person has to spend a year with his wife in order to have beautiful children. The Zohar HaKadosh tells us an amazing secret. The Zohar says, the reason for why Moshe Rabbeinu came out so holy and so pure and so successful and so great and so good at everything that he does is because the love that his father had for his mother. The Zohar tells us that the more pure, the more love, the more kind there is between, the more kindness there is between a husband and his, and her, and his wife, the better the neshama of the child, the better the child will come out. That's an amazing fact. So marriage is to elevate each other. The word marriage in Hebrew is nesu'in. Nesu'in means laset, to carry, to uplift. The job of a wife is to uplift her husband, to move him up to a more higher spiritual, physical realm. And the same thing, the job of a husband is to uplift his wife, to move her up to a more spiritual and physical, better place in this world. Now the way we do that, the way we get beautiful, pure, good children that will be happy and that will be successful in everything that they do is by working on increasing the love between a husband and his wife. Now we know anytime we want to study a topic in the Torah, the way to do it is to study the first place it was mentioned in the Torah. Where was the first place in the Torah talking about a wedding? Everybody knows the first man that was created, Adam. He was created perfect at the age of 20. And Chava, his wife Eve. We find in the Torah a very interesting phenomenon. God created men and women as one entity. Men and women were attached to each other in the beginning of creation. They were one of a whole. Then Hashem decided it's time to split them up and let them earn each other, let them work and create a unit in union, a marriage where they will be a perfect uh, match for each other. So Hashem decided to make Adam Arishon fall asleep, to put him to sleep. That was the first surgery where they put man to sleep. God puts Adam Arishon to sleep. He separates his wife from him. And Rashi is bothered by, why did Hashem have to put Adam Arishon to sleep? Why didn't he just separate him while he was awake? Rashi answers, the reason is because God knew that if Adam Arishon will see his wife bleeding or he is bleeding while his wife is being separated from him, it will disgust him. It will cause a feeling of, ew, she is not so beautiful. And that will cause a separation between his heart and her heart. So God said, I am not going to let Adam Arishon see his wife in a situation, in a position where she doesn't look her best. So he put Adam Arishon to sleep. Very interesting. Think about it. The first man was created perfect in heaven. 
He doesn't care about physical desires. He doesn't care about what the looks of his wife is. He cares about Ruchnia's spirituality, being connected to Hashem, you, him and his wife becoming one. That's all he cares about. Yet God said, I can't let Adam Arishon watch his wife while she is not at her best. It seems like the nature of men, even the holiest men of all times, the first man of creation who was created by the bare hands of Hashem himself, would be affected negatively if he would see his wife not at her best. Same thing goes for men. A man will be affected if a man will affect his wife if he will not be at his best. Sometimes when we get married, we get used to each other and we think, ah, she's my wife and he's my husband. I could show him anything and I could tell him anything. It seems from our Torah, we have an obligation to try to do the best that we can, to be as much as we can the best for our husband, the best for our wives, to show her that I really care about her and what she thinks of me. If a person thinks about what can I do to make my wife happy, what can I do to make her be satisfied with life, she will think the same. The Rambam says, if you treat your wife like a queen, then she will treat you like a king. The Gemara tells us that a man without a woman is a man without a blessing, is a man that is not complete, is a man that has no protection. A man without a wife is not complete. He's missing half of himself. Only after marriage you become complete. And the Gemara goes further to say that the blessing for a man's parnasa. His wealth comes through his wife, from his wife. All the commentaries ask, why is that? Why is that your wife the source of blessing for your Parnassah? What's the connection to your wife and your money and the Parnassah and the job outside in the world and your business deals? And the Kabbalah's farm revealed to us a very important secret. They tell us that a woman was cursed by God for the sin of causing her husband to eat from the tree. And a man was cursed by God for listening to his wife and doing that sin also and eating from the tree. Each one of them got their own sets of curses. Man got the curse of Bezeata Pechato <clears throat> A man has to work hard, very hard, to earn a living. He has to sweat. At the sweat of your brow, you should eat bread. But a woman, has a different curse. A woman will suffer giving birth, will have pain, but also she will be under the control of her husband. Her yearning, her desire will be her husband. That's her curse and that's his curse. If a man does his job by treating his wife like a queen, making her feel like she is in charge, making her feel like she is so special, making her feel like she has a say in the matter, that her opinion is very important to him. That man basically just took this woman outside of the curse that God placed on her from the beginning of time. He took away, he removed the curse. There's no more you're under the control of your husband. We're one, we're a unit. Once you did that to your wife, she's not under your control. Rather, we're together, we're one. God says, measure for measure is the way of God. Mida keneged mida is my way. I will take you out of your curse of Beziat pecha to chalachim. At the sweat of your brow, you have to eat bread. Hashem will, the blessing will be thrown upon you in such a massive way that you won't be able even to say, thank you Hashem, because Hashem gave you so much. But that only comes if you remove, if you take a woman out, outside of her curse. The topic of tonight's lecture is our children and the influence of our marriage over our children. There's a story I would like to share with you with Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zichon Tzadik Kadosh Livracha, spoke over the story and he said, when the Jewish people came from Europe to America, we find that the generation right after they came started becoming not religious, started losing their faith in Hashem, their trust in Hashem, started working on Shabbat. 
Rav Moshe Feinstein said, I don't understand. Why is that? Back then, a Jew was not able to keep his job more than a week. As soon as they found out that you don't work on Shabbat, they would fire you. So a man would go to work, and Friday would come, he would tell, tell his employer, today is the last day I can work for you. On Sabbath, I have to stay home. I'm a Jew. I observe the Sabbath. And then his employer would say, if you don't come on Sabbath, then you don't come on Sunday and on Monday. There's no work for people who are not dedicated to the work. And a Jew would come home every single Friday with his paycheck, and have to look for a job after Shabbat. Sitting at the Shabbos table will discuss with his wife what he went through at work and how he was fired. He would share his pain of how difficult it is to be a Jew. His son was sitting and listening. It's difficult to be a Jew. It's difficult to keep Shabbat. Even though his father and his mother were willing to sacrifice everything, not to have food on the table, to keep Shabbat. But the child would hear his father saying, Oi! How difficult is it to be a Jew? That would take the spirituality of Judaism from his son's heart. That would put a stumbling block in front of his son. His son would say, why do I need to be an Orthodox Jew if it's so difficult? He won't understand the beauty of the religion when his father is kvetching and saying, Ay, it's so hard. So Rav Moshe Feinstein said that generation after the holy people who came from Europe went all off the path, intermarried, because they heard their parents feeling and talking about how difficult it is to be a Jew. We have an obligation. We have a mission. Hashem told us to get married, to have children in this world. Our job is to bring these children closer to our Creator, to our Father in Heaven. And the only way we could do that is if we live life in a positive light. We always talk nice and positive about people and about each other. Imagine a home where the parents are sitting at the Shabbos table and the mother tells the children, kids, kids, daddy is saying it's Var Torah right now. Everybody quiet. Daddy is a very smart man. We have to listen to what he has to say. And when he ends the Dvar Torah, the mom says, ah, you just filled me up with holiness. That was amazing. The kids are going to walk out of the table saying, our father is a smart man and it's worth it to listen to him. If mother tells children, kids, you have to learn Torah, it's very important. But then when father gives a speech on the Shabbos table, giving a drosha, giving a dvar Torah, the mother is busy talking to the other kids or doing the dishes or walking in and out of the table. No matter how many times mother will tell the children, it's very important to learn Torah. It's not going to work. She's talking while Father is saying Advar Torah. She's doing the dishes. She's, she's, she's busy doing other things. It's not going to work. How many times did we tell our children that Torah is very important and mitzvahs are very important? But then, when a piece of china falls on the floor, when a plate falls on the floor, when a cup glass shatters, we scream and say, Oy vey! The China set. But then, when a safer falls on the table, when a book falls on the table, a holy book, we say, kiss the safer, put it back on the shelf, please. What does a child learn from that? A child learns that a china or a glass, a glass cup is more important to us than a safer Torah. What does a child learn when he sees that his mother and his father talking constantly negative about other Sephardi people, Ashkenazi people, Hasidish people. A man came to his Rebbe and he said to Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach and he said, Rebbe, how come my children don't want to learn Torah? They're not Torah scholars. And my neighbor, he's a shoemaker and all his children are learning in Kolo. So Shlomo Zaman Orbach told him, Rav Yid, the nature of man is to speak negative about his own kind. You're a Talmud Chacham. You probably said about some rabbis, ah, they don't know what they're talking about. This rabbi doesn't know what he's saying. This hashkafa is not for us. This is not good. So your children grow up saying, why should I grow up to be a Talmud Chacham? All I hear is negative things about Talmud Chachamim. The shoemaker spoke negative about the shoemakers. That shoemaker is not as good as me. That shoemaker is not so successful. That shoemaker's business closed down. 
My business is doing well. He never spoke negative about Talmid Chachamim. So his children grew up saying, why should I be a shoemaker? I'd rather be a Talmid Chacham. What we speak is very, very important to our children. Everything we say is recorded in their minds. Two years ago, I sat at a Shabbos table. You know, that rich man, he gave such a big donation to the yeshiva. Wow, how lucky he is. Only if he had a little bit of his money, I would do so much. With so much enthusiasm and excitement, I spoke about that rich man. But then, two years later, when I spoke about the Talmid Chacham, who said a beautiful chidush, I said, wow, what a nice chidush. I wish I also was a Talmid Chacham, I was a scholar. The child heard this conversation and he said, when he spoke about the rich man two years ago, he was so enthusiastic and he wished he was rich. When he spoke about a Torah scholar, he said, yeah, you know, it would have been nice if I was a Torah scholar also. He picks up on the enthusiasm. One time I was sitting and making brachot to Bishvat. You know, we make brachot on fruits. God blessed us with beautiful fruits and we make different blessings. Ha'eitz, Ha'adama, Shechianu. And I was about to make a blessing and my son stopped me and he said, Daddy, Daddy, you already made a bracha on this fruit. And I turned to him and said, Oh, thank you so much, my son, for telling me that. For months later, it haunted me. If my son would have told me, Daddy, Daddy, don't do this, you're about to lose $50,000. Would I have turned to him and said, Oh, thank you so much, my son, for telling me that? Oh, would I have kissed him on the forehead and said, Oh, how lucky I am to have you thanked him profusely many times. You saved me from damage of harm at $50,000. So my son picked up from this, that when he saved me from saying a bracha levatala, God's name in vain, I said, thank you, my son, that's worth five bucks. It's worth five dollars. But when I saved from 5,000 or 10,000 or 50,000, I jumped with joy and I kissed him on the forehead and I told him, ah, my son, what would I do without you? I love you so much. Thank you so much. What message does that give to our children? What we say affects our children tremendously. We have to try to become positive people. We have to try to think in a positive way. How wonderful would the house be if a wife every once in a while tells her husband in front of the kids, Oh, my dear husband, how wonderful you are. How lucky I am that I have you as a husband. The children will hear that and see the positivity in the mother. And the, the husband, the same to the wife, and they will say, Wow, our parents really, really like each other. They're so good to each other, so nice to each other. That will carry on into their lives. The only reason for why we have problems with our marriages is because what we saw at home did not teach us anything good. Everything we do affects our children. Imagine... A family going to a wedding. The kids are running around. Father and mother are talking to each other after the wedding. The first thing that the mother says to the father, Oh, the food was horrible. The kids are sitting in the back of the car listening to the conversation of father and the mother about this wedding. Instead of talking about the holiness and the spiritual and the moment of wedding, instead of mentioning the opportunity that they had under the chuppah, you know when a, when a couple get married under the chuppah, that's the day that they were born. That's the day that they get to erase all their sins. That's the day when they create themselves as, a, as one unit. Instead of talking about the holiness of the moment, they talk about the food, they talk about the negative things at the wedding. The children walk out of there thinking, what's a wedding good for? It's, it's you know, you, all, you go for a party when you want to, but you come back home, you complain about everything. What do the children learn from their parents about that? So we have to be very, very careful what we say, how we express ourselves to our children. As I said, Moshe Rabbeinu came out to be this great giant, great Torah scholar for one reason, the tremendous amount of love and care that his father showed his mother and his mother showed his father. Chazal tell us that his soul became a very powerful and pure soul because of that. We have to keep that in mind. As we are raising our children, we have to realize we have a mission. Hashem wanted us to get married mainly for bringing beautiful children into this world. I want to bless all of you, those who are listening and those that are not, that you should merit to live a full, happy, positive life, to raise children to the fullest potential, to show them the beauty of our Torah, the beauty of marriage. And may God bless all of you with strength and health and happiness. Amen.